Hello, I'm Dr. Gloria Horsley. And I'm her daughter, Dr. Heidi Horsley. Heidi and I want to welcome you to Open to Hope Conversations, the podcast. We believe that the greatest gift you can give yourself after a loss is hope, using this moment to connect with others who have not only survived, but thrived. So let's get started. Welcome to the Open to Hope show. I'm your host, Dr. Gloria Horsley, with my daughter and co-host, Dr. Heidi Horsley. Well, Heidi, we are lucky that we've got a terrific expert today. She's an expert on man-made natural disasters, and you've kind of come up with one yourself, haven't you? I am positive for the coronavirus, and it has been a really stressful time, and I am really, really happy that we are talking today with one of the leading experts in how to help families in the country and in the world. Um, So our guest today is Dr. Donna Sherman. She is the Senior Director of Advocacy and Training at the Dougie Center. She was the executive director at the Dougie Center for 25 years. Uh, she writes and trains internationally on bereavement, and she is currently serving on the, the National Board of Directors for the Compassionate Friends, and she has served on numerous board of directors. So Donna, thank you for coming on today. Well, thank you, uh, Heidi and Gloria, for inviting me, and also I am glad to hear you're feeling a little bit better, Heidi. Yeah, it has oh. been a really strange thing to have this, this virus because you just don't ever think it's going to happen to you, I guess. And I think for me, and I know for many that the stressful thing has been not knowing what it's going to look like, what the future is going to look like, where you're going to go with it and, and having to self isolate. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things you just said really highlights something to me, which is the families that we work with at the Dougie center and other programs throughout the country, working with children and families who've had a death in their family or who have a family member with an advanced serious illness. Mm-hmm. Um, I think a lot, of our, a lot of us protect ourselves from things that could happen by saying this happens to other people, not us. Mm-hmm. You know, if we do X, Y, and Z, and if we do the right thing, our family won't experience, you know, loss or death or severe illness car crashes, everything. And I think that the difference here with the virus is that it is a universal thing that really is impacting everyone on the planet. Um, I think one of the challenges is for families like ours, for example, we have uh, 400 families Mm -hmm. and all the children in those families and all of the parents or adult caregivers of those children who are already grieving Mm -hmm. the death of someone in their life, thinking, you know, this is the worst thing that can ever happen to us, often expressing that they don't feel that others understand, Mm -hmm. or they're there for a little while, you know, after a funeral. And, And again, it varies. Some people have more social support than others. But now we're obviously in a situation where, uh, although we're told to give social distance, I think realistically it would be better termed physical distance. Mm -hmm. Like we don't, we're having, we're having social connection right now. You know, we're not having social distance, we're having physical distance. And so the degree, you know, I think that the danger is that some of the people who are already grieving, who already have a family member, for example, with an advanced serious illness, will feel even more minimized and less social support in the scope of everything that's happening. And that's a real concern. I I hear what you're saying, yeah. I I think that uh, it must be difficult too to separate your feelings about this and your feelings about a recent loss. I mean, uh, how, do you, how do you do that? What do you suggest that people do, Donna, if they're in acute grief right now? And then, and then there's this fear and anxiety around this virus. Yeah, well, I think that, first of all, just recognizing that feeling anxious and feeling increased concern is a normal human response to a, a real threat. So to just allow yourself to say, these are challenging times. These are anxiety producing times. So given that reality, what can we do as a family to help mediate that very real reality? 
and I think one of the things is uh, setting new routines. You know, so we're looking at a different normal now with families being home, with kids being out of school, with a lot of people either working from home or losing their jobs and being at home. Mm -hmm. So I think um, trying to set new routines for the family so every day is not a free for all. You know, having meals together as possible, making sure if possible, and this isn't going to be the case for everyone, but if you can get outside and take a walk, um, so far, you know, I'm in Portland, Oregon, we're, we're uh, sheltering in place, but we're able to like walk down the street or walk around the block or take a bicycle ride. Um, even just being on a porch or a balcony to get some, uh, hopefully some fresh air, to be in tune with nature, and then to really, as a family, talk about what are the things we can do together and individually so that we are supporting one another and giving each other space while we're still confined together. And to really brainstorm and make plans together as a family and also to revisit those plans. Is it working? Is it not working? Um, so there's I, I, yeah, I think one of the big challenges Heidi was talking about it today, Heidi, you might want to talk about it is school, right? We're trying to work from home. Like you said, our kids are online school. They need us more than they usually do because they're not in the classroom anymore. So I think it's creating, as you know, Donna, a lot of stress on families, a lot of additional stress. And then on top of that, a lot of families are grieving. Yeah. Yeah. So again, I think recognizing that, acknowledging that, really looking at what are some positive steps, not to be Pollyanna about mm -hmm. it, not to ignore the very real uh, situation that's happening, but also to look at what are the kinds of things we can do, again, together and separately, in order to keep ourselves healthy, to keep moving physically. Uh, right now, in our part of the country, um, this is spring break, so we weren't having school anyway. Mm -hmm. And so I think it hasn't really hit the reality for a lot of kids, like, okay, next week when the non-spring break is over and, you know, will school start again? Will they not? Mm -hmm. And, you know, how does that online or at home school go? It's, I will say this though, for anyone who has a computer, uh, Google searching resources, there are a lot of resources out there that are really good ones on what can our family do together for young children with teens. And, you know, I think as we all know, having come through personal tragedies of loss of family members that, you know, uh, Heidi, you and I share the death of a sibling. Mm -hmm and uh, glory of the death of, of a child, we know that tr uh, positive things can still happen in our lives, even as after tragic events. Well, and I think that's important, Donna, because we are really being overwhelmed and flooded with, with negative and stressful and anxiety provoking news and, you know, stories, et cetera. Yeah, and I think we, we can, one of the ways that I look at it is, I, I don't know if we can even say when things are back to normal, but when things are back to a different normal mm -hmm. in the world post this particular crisis, and there are other public health crises that are happening at the same time in terms of the climate and so on, um, how will we each as parents, as spouses, uh, as individuals, look back on the time and how we used it, that we have uh, an opportunity to really focus on what matters, to focus on attending to our loved ones, to focus on uh, possibly even mending broken relationships, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and to think about, is it worth keeping you know, grudges and maybe going back to writing some letters uh, I think another thing families can do in terms of those who've had a more recent death is to look at doing kind of photo albums together to, to look at ways that we can still 
use the time productively even as we have this uh, uncertainty around us. And what about family members that are terrified that somebody is going to get the coronavirus in their family and die because they've already had a death and they're just terrified that somebody else is going yeah, to Yeah, I think of that uh, lung disease too. If you've had a family member die of uh, some kind of COPD, I mean, it's gotta be really scary for that group. Yeah, well, I think that actually is not an uncommon reaction among children when somebody dies under any circumstances, yeah. is to believe that, uh-oh, now you know that bad things can happen and hard things can happen and will everyone in your life die? So I think again, that is a valid concern to note and also to say, here are the ways that we're working together as a family to keep ourselves as safe as we can. Mm -hmm. And look at that, you know, that's why we're washing our hands, that's why we're not going into public places, all of those things. And we will do our best to support one each other. Uh, each other. And uh, unfortunately, we're already seeing, um, you know, the, the death rate increase in the United States as well as around the world. So that will be a reality for some, some families and some children. Well, and I know it's important to um, help children manage their own anxiety. And if parents have a level of anxiety that is overwhelming, kids are going to look at them and think, okay, this is the way that I need to be responding. Yeah, I mean, the biggest thing that parents and adult caregivers can do right now is to make sure you're really taking care of yourself, whatever that is. And, you know, I have various friends and contacts who are doing Zoom calls with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that a lot of therapists are still working. They're working remotely but and virtually, but we can still have communication and to have some trusted friends that you can vent with, that you can share with, that you can laugh with. Uh, the biggest thing is parents take care of yourselves, adult caregivers, y your children will take cues from you. Mm -hmm. So, and that's true. That's always been the case. Yeah. Uh, perhaps even more important now to focus on. I'm, I'm thinking of Heidi right now as we look at her because she's certainly giving her family some good cues. She is in her office by herself. They leave food at the door, right, Heidi? You have your mask and your gloves. But watching her in that room, that could be really scary for them. It is odd because they don't physically see me. Mm -hmm. But, you know, again, we can do things like we're doing now. We're doing Zoom communication, there's Skype, there's Zoom, there's WhatsApp. Um, there are a lot of ways that we can still communicate even when we can't be physically present. I agree with you, Donna, and it has been important for me from the get-go, especially for my 15-year-old, to reassure her mm -hmm. that I am doing everything I need to do. I'm resting, I'm drinking mm -hmm. liquids, I'm under a doctor's care, mm -hmm. I'm going to be okay, because mm -hmm. I think that I am, because I don't have a pre-existing condition and I'm not mm -hmm. in the age range of being in danger. So, mm -hmm. you know, that reassurance I think was really key early on when I first yeah. got when I first got the positive diagnosis. I think they looked at me like, okay, now how should we react? How serious is this? Yeah. Well, and it's all serious. And yeah. you know, I hope that people are taking it seriously mm -hmm. that exactly. we need to for one another um, take care of ourselves and and take this whole thing seriously. Um, I, we're I, looking I, at we're looking at starting virtual groups for our for our families, and um, unfortunately, not everybody has access to a computer, and that's something that you know we have to look at people who are perhaps less privileged or not able to access computers, and we're um, something to keep in mind. But I think a lot of the younger generation is used to doing things remotely. So I think there still is value in the social connection through virtual connection. My sister-in-law's in a uh, senior care center right now and she is not able to see anyone. And they took her dog out because the dog walker, they couldn't have a dog walker. So it's been really, really difficult for her. And her family were telling me they try to uh, drop notes off to her every day and mm -hmm. uh, messages to her everyday messages of love, but it's uh, a lot of uh, difficulty. I think 
one thing that we have to remind the kids particularly is that this will end sometime. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, the, the hard part is we don't know when, Yes. and we don't know how long it will be, yeah. but we do know that it will ultimately it, you know, it, we don't know. Um, but we do know that there will be an end to it and life will resume with some potential changes. Who knows? I mean, maybe salad bars will go away forever. I don't know. I mean, I think that a lot of children may look, depending on how their family responds, mm -hmm. may look at this as a very fond time. As, as weird as that may sound, that if the family is doing, say dad is off at work all the time, mom's off at work, and they see their parents every once in a while, a little bit before dinner, now everybody's together, there is the potential that as a family, I see it in our neighborhood, families are taking walks together, they're taking bike rides together. You know, it's not hundreds of people out there, they're keeping distance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, kids could take it, some of this, as, wow, I know hard things were going on, but our family got very close, and we have a lot, I have a lot of fond memories from that time. That's, that's what we create for them. That's the opportunity we have. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of cooking going on, too, and people <laughs> talking about what recipes they would like to make. And uh, my daughter, uh, Heidi's sister, and her family are connected with us. We live right across the street, so we always eat with them. So we've been connected together. But everybody went around the other day and decided what they'd like food-wise that they are going to cook and uh, what they'd like to see happen. So that was kind of fun. Yeah. I also, um, in our neighborhoods, we, we see um, some people are like sitting out on their porches playing instruments and people oh, cool. are bringing chairs around, again, 20 feet, 30 feet across the street away from each other, but still uh, communing with each other. You know, depending on where you live, that may or may not be possible. I love the idea of the instruments because you saw, I don't know if you saw the video in, in Italy, you probably did where people were out on their balconies playing music. Yes. It was amazing. Yeah. yeah. Well, Donna, uh, you're on the board of Compassionate Friends. I know they're doing some things, right? Yeah. I mean, we're, we're looking at various ways that we can help all of the chapters in the United States and Compassionate Friends for uh, parents who've had a child die at any age or those who've had a sibling die or a grandchild die, um, hundreds and hundreds of chapters throughout the United States. We've been doing some webinars to help chapter leaders uh, know how to do virtual chapter meetings. So that's, that's just starting and certainly we'll be posting different kinds of resources on the Compassionate Friends website as well. Uh, awesome. Great. Well, thank you. And give us uh, some of your best advice for people who are, are trying to get through this together. Yeah, I think um, it's ironic. Like we're, we're in it together alone, you know, in this weird <laughs> way. But I think it would be tempting and for some people to just kind of hole up and, and kind of sink into the problems. And I think if we could all look at how we can help others and even by reaching out that phone call, that card, you know, revive the lost art of letter writing, whether it's through snail mail or email, and just thinking about who could I reach out to today that may not have the same privileges that I have mm -hmm. of, you know, a roof over my head and, you know, family. So, I think that when we give back to others, um, it also helps us. And it's a time for us to pull together, really pull together as a worldwide community to support one another. Oh, well, thank you so much for being on the show today. It's been thank great you. seeing you and talking to you. Thanks. I look forward to seeing you uh, when we can physically hug. And I hope Absolutely. it's not too far off. Absolutely, Donna. Thank you so much for everything you do, not just right now, but in the world. With, with disaster, with grief and loss. I mean, you've done so much to bring hope to the world. And please out there, if you've had a loss, please go visit the Dougie Center. 
I tell everybody about it. You have amazing resources for families that are grieving. Yeah, we are posting. We just developed two new tip sheets. They're free. They're downloadable. We also have some podcasts. And uh, the tip sheets are relevant to what's happening right now. Dougie.org on our website. Okay, great. Thank you again, Donna. Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. And Heidi and I want to remind you always that if you've lost hope, Please lean on ours until you find your own, and God bless. I'm Dr. Heidi Horsley. You have been listening to Open to Hope, the podcast. You can follow Open to Hope on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. To learn more, visit us at opentohope.com and go to Apple Podcasts to subscribe. I'm Dr. Gloria Horsley. Join us again next week for another Open to Hope conversation, where we invite you to lean on our hope until you find your own.